Hi everyone, welcome. So this is the first question of recommended questions to attempt for ramping up on your programming language. So for this series, we'll be working on the series of easiest questions in strings and arrays and we'll be tackling it in Python. For other languages that you might want to attempt in, let me know and I'll be creating similar videos for this as well. The beauty of tackling these easy questions is that the concept behind solving each of these questions are regardless of what language you use. There might be some intricacies related to every question if we use different languages, but at the end of the day, the high level concept and strategy to solve a question is the same. So with that, we'll be starting with the first one, which is find a value of variable after performing operations. So some tips, <coughs> since it's the first video, here's some tips. Please start off with understanding the question first. And understanding the question is a form of risk management. It derives the worst case scenario of you coming up with an approach that would not work. Because the worst case is you misunderstanding the question only to realize that any approach that you come up with afterwards is not going to work. A second tip is that after understanding the question, you would want to break down the possible approaches for solving the problem before going into programming. For each of these high-level approaches, come up with some pros and cons, make a good first educated guess on which is the best approach and then go with that. So afterwards, after you come up with the solution, there are some tactics you can do to ensure that your approach is right under pressure. Imagine that you're taking a technical interview, you would want to trace out your code, come up with test cases and ensure that your approach works against these test cases. Regardless, this is just a little primer, a little delve into what we'll be doing in the subsequent steps. So with that, let's start with this question. So I will first articulate the question first. There is a programming language with only four operations and one variable x. And these are the four possible combinations. You have two pluses followed by x or x followed by two pluses. You increment the value of the variable by one. And if you have two minus coming forward followed by x or x followed by two minuses, you decrement the value of the variable by one. And initially the value of x is zero. So given an array of string operations containing a list of operations, return the final value of x after performing all the operations. So at this time, we have read the question and we have a rough understanding of what the question is about. In this case, we know that we will have a list of strings. We are supposed to check it. And based on these strings, we have to tell whether if it is an increment operation or a decrement operation and then we increment or decrement the value. But sometimes you might read the question and realize that you might still have a fuzzy understanding of the question. So what I would recommend, the second tactic you can do is going through some test cases. So that's what we're gonna do here. In this case, we have an operations list of strings of three items inside there. And the first operation is a decrement and second and third is an increment. So in this case, the final value will be 1 because you decrement it. The value of x will be negative 1. You increment it, now it's 0. And finally, if you increment it again, the final value is 1. And that's why you get output 1. At this point, it's very tempting to just assume that after going through one example, you understand the question. That's not true. So to de-risk the worst case scenario of us misunderstanding the question, I would recommend going through all test cases provided. So in this case, for the second test case, you have three operations. In this case, all three operations are increments, and that's why you get three. For the final example, you have a list of four operations. So the first two operations will increment it, and the last two operations will decrement it. And that's why you get zero. They cancel out each other, right? 
and we have went through the three test cases but sometimes the three test cases might not be exhaustive it's a common tactic to come up with a few more test cases and also read the constraints to better understand what other types of inputs we can receive so over here we can see that the question tells us your operations list can be from containing one item up to 100 items and every single item in your list can either be plus plus x x plus plus minus minus x or x minus minus so in this case it's saying that the strings in the list can only have four possible states so it's pretty it's easier for us because now we know that we only have to handle these four possible outcomes at this point like frankly frankly this is one of the easier questions so there's really not much possible solutions for this approach I would say the approach here for this question is pretty straightforward but here's what I would do and here's how I would recommend tackling the question so as we mentioned the first step is always to provide a high level approach oh yes please yeah thank you so the first step would be to iterate every value in operations so in this case the value here to be specific is a string and what we're going to do here is that we're going to check every operation if it's an increment or a decrement so check if value is an increment or decrement operation so you will use the equal double equal operator to check two strings and if it's an increment you increment x in this case like i missed out one step which i have done which is to define a final value x of type integer so at this point if it's an increment then i will increment x or decrement x and finally after checking all operations, you can be sure that your final value is the final value and that's why you will return x in this case. The benefit of coming out with a high level approach is that when you are writing out the code, all you have to do is to focus on the syntax and the new concepts that you have learned. If you have not came up with a high level approach, you will have to come up with both the high level approach and the low level details on the fly. And frankly, our human brains are not really designed to come up with both at the same time. So I would always recommend coming up with a high level approach. At this point, you might be tempted to just go ahead and come up with an implementation right off the bat. I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend exploring a few other ways to do it. Personally, I can think of other ways to do it, but there's really not much difference in each of these approaches and since we're tackling one of the simpler questions in this case it's fine but as we tackle harder questions please slow down and think of a few more approaches to tackle this question before you choose one of them so at this point I'm just going to spoil it for you and that this is just good enough and the next step would be to implement it so at this point um, you might want to also before rushing into, into the implementation you might also want to come up with a few test cases so in this case like, I guess you can come up with a few clusters of test cases so the idea is that you want to give like a meaning to each of these test cases and try to have an understanding of what you're testing for so let's say the first type of test cases can be purely contains only increment operations purely contains only decrement operations you might contain both increment and decrement operations or maybe you might contain no operations so these are the four types of possible test cases you might have there might be more but in this case spoiler alert this is pretty much it you do not always have to do this if you feel that the question is pretty straightforward and you have practiced on many questions and you are sure of what you're doing it's fine to go ahead but the idea is the more unfamiliar you are with the question the more defensive you should be and coming up with types like groups of test cases would give you the assurance that your high level approach would address all of these test cases so this is a pretty simple question so we don't really have to 
do that too rigorously. But in this case, this would be something like plus plus x, maybe maybe just one, or maybe this would be minus plus x or maybe, or maybe in this case for the third time you might have both plus plus x and x plus plus, and finally you could have an empty list like this. So hopefully this is clear and. These classes of test cases would let us would give us more clarity in testing out the approach after tackling it. So with that, let's get started. So we will first implement defining a value of x. Okay, so let's define x over here. Let me bring this down so that you can see more of the code. This will be an integer we're signing to zero. And afterwards for operation in operations. So you can use this in keyword to assign every single value in your list into this copy here. And afterwards you can do if operation is equals to x plus plus x or operation equals to x plus plus then x increment one else x minus equals one and at this point we are done with the second the second step the final step is just returning x so in this case this would be return x so this is this is not really an interview so you're allowed to just run your code and check whether it's correct but sometimes you might not be given that chance in a technical interview so i would like to introduce another tactic for checking your approach if it's right or wrong and that's called tracing the idea is you become the python interpreter and you pass the clusters of test cases through your algorithm to be sure that it's correct so in this case i'll show you how it's done so in this case like you have an operations defined on line two of types this string right so let's try using the first test case which is this so this would be plus plus x and here's what i would do i would assign some comments to keep track of the value of each variable that i define here so in this for loop in the first iteration operation would be a new variable that is assigned the same value as the first item in this so in this case operation will be equal or type string will be equals to plus plus x Okay, sorry, I should have used R here actually. I have to switch between this and C++. So, uh, in this case, operation will be equals to plus plus x and the check terminates because this is already true. So, your Python interpreter would not check the second statement because it knows that this is already true. So, in this case, this would be this whole expression on line 25 would evaluate the true and you would increment this. So, at this point, x would be equals to 1. And that's pretty much it, like because there's only one item, this for loop operation will terminate and you will return one. So at this point we're done with tracing the first the first test case. Let's go through the second test case. So we'll be using this instead. So this will be equals to minus minus. And now we'll remove every of the comments here. And we will start tracing the second test case. The second test case would be this. In this case, x will be equals to zero first and operation is equals to minus minus x at this point we'll check whether if minus minus x is equals to x plus plus the first the first expression is false so python will evaluate the second expression afterwards in this case minus minus x is not equals to x plus plus so this is false as well and since both are false this statement would be false this would not be executed so we will fall back to line 28 in this case x will be negative one and you will return x plus the negative one and that's true like in this case the expected answer is one expected equals to negative one and we can see that these two results are the same now we'll go through the third test case which is containing both increment and decrement operators so this would be x plus plus okay so this will be equal to zero and now let me remove all my comments for the second test case. Operation equals, in this case, would be assigned to one to the first item in your list. So this would be negative, negative x. It's a copy just to be sure we're on the same page. So in this case, the first expression will evaluate to false. 
because minus minus x is not plus plus x, so it's false. Or minus x, minus minus x is equal to x plus plus, this is also false. So this expression on line 25 would not be executed, and you would fall back to the else case, and you would decrement x. So x would be negative 1. Now we would assign this to the second value here, and in this case, this expression is true. And hence we increment this and we get zero. So the expected here is equal to zero, right? And the actual here is equal to zero. And finally, the final test case, operation is zero, it's just empty, x is equal to zero. In this case your follow will not even will not even execute because there's no item in operations. So you will just return zero right off the bat. Expected is equal to zero, and you do indeed get zero. So this is an example of tracing out your code line by line and listing out the state of every variable as it runs through your algorithm step by step. So these are some so this is how I would recommend tackling questions. It allows you to really understand what's going on on every single line of your code without having to run the code and it also reinforces your understanding of what you're doing on every single line. It admittedly takes much more time, but when you tackle every question with the intention to truly understand the question and ensure that your code is defensively correct, you will not only reinforce the concepts used in the question, you're also preparing yourself and adopting tactics to ensure that you perform well in technical interviews. You can choose to not adopt these tactics for easier questions that you know that you are stronger in, but for questions that you know that you are shaky on, I would highly recommend this approach of understanding the question, going through all the test cases, coming up with multiple approaches, and clustering your test cases. Testing your clustering of test cases by tracing and ensuring that it's correct. So there's a lot of steps here. But I hope that this video would be a good reminder to you on how to use these tactics to your advantage to ensure that your approach is correct probabilistically. So with that, that's pretty much the end of this video. I will be doing my best to document the possible approaches along with the pros and cons. But with that, I wish you all the best and good luck on your homework and tackling the subsequent questions of this series. With that, see you in the next one. So, I forgot to run this, so just to prove to you that it's correct. Okay, so it's submitted, let me just run this. And there we go, so we got it right. One final thing that I did not go through, which is the space and time complexity. So, in this case, let's say if n is the size of or size or length of your list operations, okay? Let's say then the case here is what is the time complexity? At this point, for the viewers out there, I prematurely terminated the video, but please bear with me. But the time complexity here, what I mean here is really the worst case time complexity. In other words, this is the, in the worst case scenario, how does your algorithm, how does your algorithm's uh, time taken to run scale with the size of input n, with the input size n, removing coefficients and only caring about the scale. So this is the polynomial, that's what I mean by that. So at this point, we can see that line 31 is inexpensive, regardless of how many inputs you have in operations, this will take the same amount of time. But line 32 to line 36 would be expensive because you're going through every single item in your list. So if your list has 1 million items, line 32 to line 36 will be executed 1 million times. And that's why this is ON. So this is ON time complexity. Now we will analyze the time complexity of the nested operations from line 35 to line 38. In this case, these are just comparison operators in strings. 
So for every single item, it's just O1. O1 means constant time. This means linear. Scales with size of this. And return statements is just O1 as well. And that's why your time complexity in this case will be ON. For space, in other words, like in the worst case scenario, how does your algorithms space use or RAM use? with input size n. So in this case, we would assume that it, we are not caring about the, in, the memory used by the input list. Let's just say that it's provided. And let's say your algorithm's space complexity is irregardless of the size of the input here. We are only concerned with the memory use from 937 to 946. In this case, like this is constant because we define one variable regardless of the size of input. And for operations, like every single value inside here will be assigned into a variable here. And this variable will be reused for every single item. So this memory used by this operation here will be constant as well. And all of these operations here are also constant because they are not creating a list or creating a dictionary. So in this case, like you will not have any accumulation of memory usage as you go through this operation. In this case, everything is O1, and that's why the space complexity is O1. So this is one additional step that, the additional step of checking the time and space complexity, I'm sorry for missing that out at the start, but hopefully this is a good explanation of how do we understand our algorithms time complexity and space complexity. So that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you like it and I will see you in the next video for the next question. With that, see you in the next one.